So the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative was a multi-year project. It was begun actually at the Colorado University of Boulder and then continued as a new project um, but with similar structure, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And the idea was to take all those research findings and apply them into the undergraduate classrooms, then measure those effects and share those new results. So it's a research project, but one that's a continuum. So the idea is to look at what are students learning and define that even. Some faculty have these very old, very long keywords of what they should have in every class, but it's not really defined what's the actual learning goal for the students. And then the assessments, are we even testing those learning goals? We have to look for that connection as well as what instructional approaches help the students learn. So this is sort of this triangle that we want to look at and we want everything to be measured. We don't want to just use our gut feeling exclusively, we want to really back this up with data. Are we improving the learning and in what way? So the biggest agents of change for this project turned out to be the Science Teaching and Learning Fellows, or Science Teaching Fellows, or Science Education Specialists, pick your acronym. Essentially what they are are postdocs in respective areas. So for instance, for me, I was a physicist. I had done experimental physics work. Uh, I know what it means to excel in a research lab. I know what it means to what kind of physics knowledge I have to have. So I know that part. And I'm going to work in the physics faculty where I can also go to their talks. I can go to their colloquium and I can understand what's going on. I can have those conversations with my colleagues. That's something an education specialist may not be able to do. And then I'm trained on the research into learning. So I can bring that knowledge into the faculty and then adapt it as needed for the physicist's needs. On top of that, so I would be one postdoc in the physics department, and there were uh, one at the height of it there was five postdocs in the physics department, but there would be, excuse me, STLF postdocs in the geophysics and math and chemistry, and we would meet once a week. So I could hear what they're doing there because a lot of the techniques can be done in different contexts. And I just had to hear what the math group was doing and think, oh, I could use that actually for this class in the physics department, and I could sort of take that idea over. So you had a community for the STLFs, and then your discipline community you worked in as well, and you sort of flowed between the two. Um, that also required that you, within your faculty, that you had a lot of communication skills and sort of consensus building. You have to get the faculty to agree on certain things to be what is the main thing we want to teach, essentially, and you need to work with the faculty. So you have the content knowledge that these postdocs need to have, as well as sort of communication negotiation skills. Those were sort of the, the, what would make the STLF what you needed in this, in this change. Um, they would also work uh, very intimately with instructors on developing curriculum material and going and giving them feedback to their classes and also then they would collect the data to support what's going on to check the, to do the measurements to show even the instructors how they could themselves monitor from year to year what's changing. So what does that look like for the instructor who is working with the STLF? Well, they have to be given these resources. So resources include the personnel like an STLF or more teaching assistants. They need to have time to do these new materials, to have these meetings. That could be in the form of a teaching buyout. It could be in a form of less teaching assignments for one year if you're going to transform a course. But also what we see is the instructor calls it a better use of their face time with the students. The instructors are getting more out of their lecture. They're not just leaving saying, I hope the students got it. They know if the students got it or not. And I want to put this out here at this moment just real quick. Some people say, well, you need to be theatrical. You need to be able to sort of sell this. And that's not true. We worked with several instructors who were rather shy, not so theatrical instructors who were very good at their field, and their um, student evaluations were not necessarily the highest. And when they switched to the active teaching methods, they were getting better student evaluations. Maybe not at first, because there's a learning curve, but at the end they were. And the reason is, their personality no longer was the focus for 50 minutes. The content was now the focus. So it didn't matter if the person was shy or theatrical or whatever, because the content was what moved the everybody forward. And so I just wanted to put that out there, because I think that's a really important point. Um, the instructors would also meet with the STLS for personal feedback, for reflection. Again, we would monitor their results and show them how they could monitor their own results in subsequent years. And we would also sometimes do co-teaching with them so that they could practice these skills. And I say instructor, but this can easily and should be carried over to any teaching assistants that have, that have teaching loads because they're teachers in training. So we tried to get them in as soon as possible as well. We actually put in a TA training that they could also learn some of these skills.
Um, what does it look like from the department's point of view? Well, they need to make the resources available. In one respect, that's money for the personnel and for the faculty compensation if they have a teaching buyout. But it's also they might have to reconsider classroom spaces, lab spaces. Is this conducive to group work? How can I incorporate that? And they need to figure out some reward structures for teaching. Very often teaching is sort of pushed down to the side over research. And I'm not trying to underscore research by any means. But we need to realize the time that, student, that teachers and instructors would put into changing a course. And we can do that by planning their teaching assignments. If they're going to transform a course, they can have that course for three or four years where they can do iterations when they see things aren't working. They can also maybe be guaranteed that a teacher who's going to take over their course at the end won't just go back to a frontal lecture and put all their work in the bottom of a dresser somewhere or a drawer and it's never going to be used again. So you have to have the department really on board and committed as well as the instructors. And then what does it look like for the students? Well, of course, that's one of the most important aspects as well. And what we see is a deeper learning and a conceptual understanding improvement on many levels in physics, in maths, in geosciences, in biological sciences. Really, across the boards, you're seeing this conceptual push. Um, we're also seeing an increase in problem-solving skills and how they approach these problems. They also are learning how to communicate like scientists. That's what's happening in these, in these dynamic environments, which is something, as I mentioned, is not part of the curriculum or is not a heavy focus of the curriculum right now. And it may be rewarding for the ESL and underrepresented students to have that opportunity during their studies. And overall, we're seeing a general increase in student engagement. Um, very often, if you look in a class after about 30 minutes of a 50-minute lecture, you will rarely see 80% truly engaged students, which is what you see when they're doing the peer instruction episodes and other research-based strategies. That was just my example today. Um, and that, of course, then does not, does not surprise when you see an increase in student satisfaction. So all of this sort of comes together. And we're also changing the attitudes and beliefs of the students into how they learn. So one quote I like to have about the, the peer instruction a student wrote, it's really helpful to hear what others think and how they approach their answers. It's useful to persuade others since you need to understand how you approach the question in mind before you verbally express them out. So again, teaching someone else is the best way to learn. And students never have that. They're used to answering questions. Or used to, excuse me, they're used to asking questions. They're not as used to answering questions in a verbal way. They're used to answering questions with numbers, but not with these descriptions. And so that's what's um, contributing to their conceptual understanding and these language skills. So what is the impact of SEI? These are some numbers. I'm running a little bit short on time. These are some numbers I just want to show you to show that we've gotten about 50% of the faculty, both at Colorado University and at University of British Columbia, to have some support of change for these methods. Um, they've worked with an STLF or they've gone to seminars that we've offered. And what we know from research is that a lot of individual instructors at universities or a group of individual instructors may try some of these methods, but it's difficult without some support network. If you try it and you're struggling it, and your department doesn't support you, you kind of go back just to doing a frontal lecture. And what we saw is with this support network, we actually had only one of the 70 faculty we work with not continue use of these instructional strategies. So this is all showing that you need to put that structure in place. Um, but what's also promising, because some people I know we think about money and the departments are always don't have enough, but it's an, it's an initial big cost. However, 90% of the users that we worked with went on to use these instructional methods in additional courses they taught with little or no support from us. So it's something that can be then done in a sustainable way once you have that initial support in place. Um, and I want to just end with the impact on student learning. So this study came out in 2014 where they really looked at 225 studies analyzing active learning versus traditional lecturing. And so the students, not only are they starting to recognize the benefits, but they're starting to demand active learning. And when you look at this graph, you kind of see why. So the students, it's when you have this big shift that you see here, the active learning increases the examination performance by about half a letter grade. That's a substantial gain, consistent throughout the literature. At this point, you almost need to argue or defend why are we even using traditional lectures, at least exclusively. Um, in fact, uh, there's, you can be a bit provocative, which I sometimes like to be. So if this was a, a health study and we were looking at a new 
antibiotic, I think at this point there's enough studies to say, yes, we would take this over. And in any case, we would compare an antibiotic to the next best antibiotic. By comparing active learning to traditional learning, we're kind of comparing our antibiotics to like bloodletting. So at some point we have to go, yeah, we've moved past this. We know the active learning is better and we need to get the active learning better and look into how to make that the best way. So that's where, again, having all this support and having these STLS and having these conversations with the instructor can bring the entire department sort of up a level. With that, I just want to conclude with the, um, that I, I hope that you guys are going to walk away thinking that the effective teaching can develop this kind of expertise, that there is new methods out there that can do these large classes, but also small classes, that you can have more specific, timely feedback for the learners. We see that these active methods have demonstrated with evidence of improved learning. And we see also that the SEI model can support such change for all across the STEM um, subjects. I just want to also stress again that one of the biggest change was this internal support for the STLFs. This was really critical to the change and you need a certain critical number as well. If you have one person for the entire university, that's not going to work. That's what we, we've seen in the research, the people abandon these processes. You need to have a support network in place. But you also need the department to be critically engaged. They need to want this to work with it, to see it as an as aspect that they want. And when you have those two things, then you get really great learning of science, which is what we want. So, and I want to just thanks again to Carl Wyman, Sarah Gilbert, Warren Code, and all of my colleagues at the University of British Columbia. And thank you for your time.